Hi, everybody. My name is Lauren, Rabbi Holtzblatt, and I'm Elijah's mom, as Givera Goldstein just said, and it's such a pleasure to be with you. And Elijah's here. We are going to share our screen because we created a slideshow just for you. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to take you through some of the big parts of Justice Ginsburg's life, and then we'll tell you a little bit about how we had a special relationship with her. Um, and then we can answer any questions you have. Um, let's just see a thumbs up if you can see our screen. Can you see our screen? Okay, perfect. Okay, so this is the life of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. She lived from 1933 and she just died, uh, Erev Rosh Hashanah, um, 2000 and, uh, 2020. Okay. I'm gonna move it. Okay. Okay, so here you see Justice Ginsburg. This is at um, one of her camps. She was born in Brooklyn, New York. And her, her father was an immigrant from Odessa, so from Eastern Europe, and her mother was a first-generation American. And so she really grew up um, as someone who, who wasn't, you know, who, who didn't have years of family in the United States. She really was um, what we would think of as a um, first or second generation American. And this is her um, at her special Jewish camp, Chinawa where she gave a sermon um, and she would often pretend to be a rabbi when she was growing up. Okay, keep going. Oh, hang on one second. What do we do? Do you do that? Okay, here we go, we're good. Okay, perfect. Okay, and here what you're gonna see is um, she went to Cornell University for college, um, but at the time, women really were not going to university very much and they certainly weren't going to law school. And so she was one of only nine women in her Harvard Law School class. Eventually she met her husband, Marty, who I know you learned about this morning, and she transferred to Columbia Law School, which is in New York, and she graduated first in her class, which means that she was the best law student in her class. And you can imagine what it might have felt like to be the only one of the only women there, right? It's sometimes maybe you've been in a situation where you're the only person who has a certain character trait or who's doing something for the first time. So this was a, a very big deal in her life to have to pave a path forward for not only women, but for people who were not always given the opportunities as others. Okay, let's go to the next one. So here you see her pictured. Um, she did a few things after law school. She couldn't find a job because no law firm in New York where she was living would hire her. And so instead of becoming um, upset about it, she decided I'm just gonna keep forging a path forward. And she worked as a professor at a university called Rutgers. And then she also founded what we call a women's rights project at the ACLU in 1972, which is really where she started working on trying to expand the law in the United States to include both men and women for equality. And what she eventually did was um, she expanded what we call the 14th Amendment, which is an amendment that protects us against discrimination. She expanded that to include gender so that male or female or however one identifies um, would have the same rights under the law. Okay, which is this one? Okay. Okay. Um, so just as if this we already, oops. Okay, it's okay. We can go to the next one. That We already said all these things. This is all of uh, the work that she did against protecting people from discrimination based on gender. So women were, had trouble at, at being admitted to schools, universities, um, receiving equal pay, um, even having their own credit cards, which is crazy for us to think about right now, right? We feel like we've come so far. And really the person who pushed our country in that direction was Justice Ginsburg. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Okay, here you see Justice Ginsburg, um, and this is with President Jimmy Carter. Um, in 1980, he appointed, she, was a, she became a judge, uh, so she wasn't a justice yet of the Supreme Court. She became a judge on the U.S. Court of Appeals in the D.C. Circuit, um, and that is a, a court that still sits in D.C., right downtown, 
And actually, Elijah's dad, Ari, also clerked. He was a law clerk, which means he worked for a judge on that very circuit that, um, that at the time, Judge Ginsburg um, sat as a judge. Um, and so first she became a judge on the U.S. Court of Appeals. And then you'll see in the next slide, for the next slide, that in 1993, she was appointed by President Bill Clinton to the Supreme Court. And she was, oh, look at your animation, beautiful. That's Elijah's doing. Um, she was only the second woman on ever um, at the time on the US Supreme Court. Uh, Justice O'Connor was the first woman, Sandra Day O'Connor. And Justice Ginsburg was the second woman appointed on the court. And actually, just as another fact, Justice O'Connor retired and at the time, uh, for several years, Justice Ginsburg was still the, was, was the only woman on the court after Justice O'Connor retired from the court. And so you see this theme of being the first, the first, the first. Um, she had a lot of firsts. She was a very strong human being um, and had a very strong character. Okay, you the next slide. Okay, so here you might recognize some people in this picture. So here you see um, our family first met Justice Ginsburg in 2014 when Ari, who is Elijah's dad, he has the beard in the picture, he clerked on the Supreme Court for Justice Ginsburg. This particular photo was taken when um, the movie came out. If you remember the movie um, uh, that was about Justice Ginsburg came out and we went to view it at the court. They had a special viewing for families of the clerks. Um, and you'll see Elijah is there with me and his older sister, Noah, who used to be a student at Milton and is now a student at lab. And um, wh what I'll say to you is that um, when Ari first clerked for the justice, um, it was a really incredible year of expansion of the law. It was the year that gay marriage was passed and health care for all was passed in the court. And Ari was able to work on those um, those decisions with the justice. Stay on that page for a minute. Um, and what ended up happening was the justice was very interested in her Jewish life. And at the time, uh, she did not have a rabbi who she was very close with. And so over the next six years, we built a relationship with our family and then myself as a rabbi. The justice and I wrote um, a special insert for Passover on all the women in the Passover story that are not always spoken about. So maybe you'll remember Shifra and Pua, who are the midwives in the story, um, or Bat Paro, who is Pharaoh's daughter who takes Moses out of the river, or Miriam, um, who is Moses' sister, who makes sure he's safe. All the women who are not necessarily always mentioned in the Haggadah, but who had a very, very prominent role in making sure that our people were, be, were, were able to flee Egypt. Um, and so she and I, over the next six years, developed a close relationship working together on lots of different issues within the Jewish community, um, in some of her writings that I was able to work on with her. Um, and it, we, we really was the gift of a lifetime. We went to the opera with her, which was very fun. Um, and um, you wanna to go to the next slide? The next slide is a little bit sad for me because uh, as many of you, we, you know, we really revered the justice both in what she did for our country, for the world. Oh, go back. We're not done with that one yet. Go back. Hang on one second. We're going a little too fast. What? You gotta go back. I'm going back. What are you doing? Go back. So what ended up happening was, um, when the justice died on Erev Rosh Hashanah, she had asked me if I would um, honor her by performing both a memorial at the Supreme Court and um, to preside over her funeral at Arlington National Cemetery, both of which I did. And here you can see a picture of me and behind me is um, the official portrait of Justice Ginsburg, which uh, Ari and I were lucky to be there in the great hall of the Supreme Court when that portrait was unveiled and it's a beautiful portrait which you are gonna now be able to see if you go with your parents to visit the court, you can see it in the court itself. Um, and here was a memorial we did um, for the justices and for 
um, Justice Ginsburg's family at the court itself. Later that week, um, the justice did not know that she would be lying in state, but her coffin was taken to the Capitol and she was the first Jewish woman to lie in state at the Capitol. And I was given the honor of being able to speak there too. Um, and then on the following, I'm trying to remember which day, I, I'm a little tired because it's been a crazy time for me, but, um, and then we did her burial at Arlington National Cemetery where she's buried right next to her husband, Marty. Um, okay, so this is our, the one of the last slide. Second to last. Second okay, and here you want to, do you want to read the next slide? Give me a sec. Elijah put this slide together all on his own, which I think is pretty fantastic. It has a lot about his theology here. Oh, thank you for watching. What does it say? No, he said. May the memory of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg be a blessing, and may we carry her legacy forward. And then we move on to the credits. And Elijah wanted to make sure we had credits in our slideshow. And you can see Elijah did the animations and helped with the pictures. And I wrote the facts and chose the pictures. And then let's unscreen share and I'll share a little bit more about um, the court here. Okay, uh, I just wanna see if I still have your attention. Are we still good? Oh, we can't see them. We gotta do the gallery view here. Okay, here, okay, good, we see you. Okay, we'll share a little bit more, which is um, one of the interesting things that I thought you might find interesting was that when I was preparing um, for my comments at the Supreme Court, I spent, um, she died on a Friday, which was, as you know, Erev versus Hashanah. And on Monday of that week, I went down and spent the day at the Supreme Court um, so that I could be with her court family, so her assistants and, all the people who work in the court itself, to really find out um, what kind of memorials had been done in the past. Um, because the ones that I've seen have been Justice Scalia, um, Justice Stevens, who were Catholic and not Jewish. And so one of my job was to figure out how do we honor a Jewish justice um, in the court? And so um, what I found out that day was that the last Jewish justice who had some kind of memorial um, was 80 years ago, and that was Justice Brandeis. And he did not have a rabbi or any Jewish presence at his memorial. And so what is one of the really amazing things was when um, she gave me this role, she was really putting her Judaism forward as one of the things that was most important to her. And it was the first time ever that Hebrew has been chanted in a religious fashion in the Supreme Court. And so I thought that was a pretty neat fact to share with you all. Um, and hopefully that will go down in the history books as a way that we as a Jewish people um, have really made an impact on this country through Justice Ginsburg and through her choices about how she wanted to be memorialized and why that was important to her.